Welcome back, bookworms. This is Mrs. K. I'm glad you could join me. On July 20th, 1969, Neil Armstrong became the first person in history to set foot on the moon. As he did so, he said these famous words, that's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. But how did he and Buzz Aldrin reach the moon? And what was their journey like? Let's enjoy the magic of reading as we read together. One Giant Leap, a historical account of the first moon landing, written by Robert Burley, with paintings by Mike Wimmer, and learn more about this amazing journey. Oh, look at that, bookworms. Uh, Mr. Control, we have lift off. July 20th, 1969, 70 miles up. The two spaceships, Eagle and Columbia, separate. They orbit inside of each other one last time. Then the Eagle begins to descend to where no human has ever been, to the moon. The eagle is like a gold speckled bug falling out of the sky, its odd shaped body plastered with many boxes, its outer walls thinner than human skin. The spacecraft's spindly legs poke out as it rides on its back. At 8,000 feet, it tilts and straightens, breaks its descent, slows, drifts down through space. The astronauts look out at last. Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin. They stand upright before two small windows. Their eyes widen. Look, rushing up toward them, the moon. It is gray. It is brown. It is blue-edged. Its billion-year-old landscape is cracked and scarred. Its surface gouged and cratered and pitted with tiny holes, like a battlefield from some ancient war. Those are very small windows. The radio voice crackles from Earth, 240,000 miles away. Eagle, Houston, you are go for landing. Armstrong tenses forward, feeling the seconds tick, aware that the fuel is sinking toward zero. Timing is everything. His gaze darts between nearby rows of switches and the strange world below. Dark ridges rise like forbidding walls. Spidery shadows creep in the rising sunlight. Boulders loom up as big as cars. He glances again at the flashing dial, fuel running short. Where can he land? Boy, that's scary. Eagle, 90 seconds of descent fuel left. Armstrong hears the warning. Now all he has ever learned is focused on this. Nothing matters but this exact moment. Aldrin's nonstop voice calls out altitude numbers. 40 feet, 35, 30, down they move down and down, fast enough to conserve precious fuel, slow enough to land somewhere safely, he hopes. The eagle dips, hovers, zigs, zags, dances over its own dark shadow. The seconds tick toward eternity. Time stops. Clouds of moon dust swirl like blackening fog, an almost terrifying blindness. And then, with only the very slightest bump, the small craft touches down. Phew, I'd feel that way too. The Eagle has landed. High overhead, Michael Collins listens but cannot see. They made it, they made it. The Columbia orbits and waits. Collins has waited a lifetime for this. Yet for him, the waiting is not over. 
in Houston on Earth. Hundreds in the control room break into wild cheers. The first humans on the moon. But in this other place, it is very quiet. It is lunar morning on the sea of tranquility. Armstrong lets out another deep breath and turns. He raises his gloved hand and meets Aldrin's gloved hand halfway. We did it. We're here. Look, there's Earth. Exploration time. Armstrong and Aldrin add still more to their spacesuits. There are new overshoes and heavier gloves, a visored helmet to protect against sunlight, and an oxygen-filled backpack thick as a sofa pillow. They pause to gaze out. An endless, mysterious wasteland, whose distant hills are as sharply outlined as nearby stones. No water, no wind, no sound, no life at all. Unbelievable. A hatch opens. Armstrong, on all fours, crawls through its small space. He moves awkwardly in his moon cocoon. Outside on the narrow porch, where a ladder is attached to one landing leg, he climbs to the bottom rung and stops. A TV camera placed in the eagle's hatchway is pointed down. Armstrong knows that back on Earth, hundreds of millions of people are watching. He jumps to the landing leg's round foot pad. He holds on. He pauses. He points his foot and steps off. The surface is as fine as powdered charcoal. The treads of his boot leave a perfectly crisp print in the dust. On the weatherless moon, it will last for millions of years. His voice sounds staticky and far away. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. In orbit, Michael Collins listens and waits. Oh my, look at that. Now it is Buzz Aldrin's turn. He climbs down feeling full of goose pimples. Together the astronauts go moonwalking. Flexing their toes and ankles, they walk stiffly, as if navigating inside a rigid balloon. But moving about is easier than they expect. They twirl like slow motion tiptoe dancers. They jog, they kangaroo hop, like two boys bouncing on a trampoline. Because of the moon's lesser gravity, they feel light as air. These are great paintings. Armstrong checks the time. They must hurry. They have just two hours on this strange and beautiful world. They use long metal tongs to collect rocks. Some are slippery with dust. Some sparkle. Some look tan or even purple. The rocks go into two large boxes that scientists will open back on Earth. Wow, only two hours. They try to plant the American flag, but underneath its surface dust, the moon is like steel. They jab the pole into the hard crust. They twist and turn, leaning with all their might. At last, they are able to balance the staff, just barely. A rod across the top keeps the flag unfurled. Then click, Armstrong takes a picture of Aldrin saluting the flag. A surprise call comes from the president. For a priceless moment, all the people on this earth are truly one. A tightness rises in the throats of the astronauts. They feel part of something so much larger than themselves. That is so cool. Yet soon it is over. They are inside again. This world is not theirs, not their own. Streaks of dirt cover their spacesuits. The smell of the moon dust hits them as they remove their helmets. Like spent cat pistols, they tell each other. They have been awake for 18 hours straight, but it feels like much more. Can they sleep now? Maybe. It is shivery cold in the cramped eagle. Aldrin curls up on the floor. Armstrong lies in a hammock stretched across the room. Exhausted. He looks up. Above him, there is an unshuttered porthole. The earth stares down. A big blue eyeball, he thinks. He blinks back at the bright blue eye, then turns and tries to sleep. 
July 21st, unease, uncertainty. This is the part they are most afraid of. This is the place where things can go terribly wrong. Armstrong and Aldrin stand quietly in the tiny cockpit. Lift off in one minute, away from here, maybe. The eagle will split into two parts. The upper half must fly up. The lower will stay on the moon, a permanent monument. Will the engine light? Will it keep on burning? They try to ease their worries, but there is no escape from this. No backing up, no doing it again, no second try. They know one thing only, failure means death. The second hand winds down, now or never. Aldrin's voice cuts into the awful stillness. Three, two, one, ascent. That means go up. At first, a frightening pause. What is happening? Then bang, whoosh, zoom. It feels as if the floor is coming up at them. The eagle's top half rises like a fast moving elevator. Its engine leaves a trail of wide white light. The eagle soars skyward silently, faster and faster. 50 miles up, almost a mile a second. Aldrin glances sideways, nods and grins into moon orbit on our way. That's amazing. Higher still, Michael Collins peers through his sextant, still waiting. Where are they? He scans the sky and sees only blackness. The Columbia has been circling now for over 20 hours. From the far side of the moon, Collins cannot even radio back to people on Earth. He squints through the sextant's eyepiece again. There! a tiny blinking light in the darkness. He locks his computer on the distant speck, tracking its approach. The eagle keeps climbing and climbing, up and up. It is like an intricate dance. Columbia leads, eagle follows, all at speeds of over 3,000 miles an hour. Now they fly in perfect formation, closer, closer. Collins punches hundreds of keystrokes to make the docking work. They touch. They connect. The capture latch is snapped shut. A small door opens into a tunnel. Look who's here. Welcome. Armstrong and Aldrin come floating through. Look how happy they are. It is the final orbit around the moon. Can a photo capture the wonder of what they've seen? Not likely. Still, the astronauts hover beside the Columbia's windows, taking pictures. The spacecraft accelerates. It curls around the moon's far edge. It is flung free like the tail end skater in a game of crack the whip. It soars into the emptiness of space. The astronauts look back with a sad, happy feeling. Hours go by. They can rest at last. They sleep, read, talk, play music. Sometimes they glimpse the slowly receding moon. Was it all a dream? No, we were there. We were there. But mostly their eyes are fixed on another place. Blue, white, light brown, and shining below them. They want that now more than anything. A planet of oceans and rivers, of grass and green hills, a world of trees and family and friends. A place called Earth, fragile, beautiful home. If you enjoyed this story, please check it out at your local library or buy a copy from your favorite bookstore.